talk about hauntings. As John said, we've written three books together. We wrote one on Grand River Avenue, which goes from the Detroit Athletic Club all the way to Lake Michigan. It's like our very own Route 66 with great stories along the way. We've written a book about iconic restaurants of Ann Arbor for any fans of Wolverines. But the book we're talking about today is actually our most popular book. It came out last year. It's called Michigan Haunts, Public Places, Eerie Spaces. And it's the only book of this kind we think in the country where, you know, you read about places with stories and haunted legends or even haunted houses, but these are all places that you can't get to. What we decided to do was essentially write a travel book about Michigan and it has an index. And these are all places you can visit around Michigan. We literally say, throw this in your glove compartment. And if you're up in Bay City, for example, there's this great supposedly haunted theater you can visit. If you go to Coldwater, there's a haunted bookstore. And Calumet, there's a haunted opera house. All throughout Michigan, there are so many places with haunted legends. And we have more than we can talk about today. So with your patience, we've, we've done this lecture hundreds of times in person. This is a, one of our first attempts at doing it online. So we're gonna get through as many as we can in about 40, 45 minutes. And then we wanna leave 15 minutes for any questions you have, or you could talk about your own stories. And we also do this caveat, it doesn't matter whether you believe in ghosts or not. All we want you to do is believe in great stories. We're storytellers. Whether you think these are true or not, doesn't really matter. You learn a lot about Michigan and history with our talks, and that's really what we want to do. And we want you to have fun and enjoy it. So please think of any questions you want and then at the end, and you can put them in the chat, and then at the end we can discuss it. So John and I are gonna just go back and forth I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna just go through some of the places in the book, but we're so happy to see you even virtually. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Here. As Gail said, this is the first time we've uh, done this with a Zoom audience. So we are asking you to uh, also tell us what you think, you know, what you might think would improve the program or might be better suited to a Zoom audience. And uh, with this crazy stuff that's going on right now, uh, we're telling you, hey, this is something you can do on your own. You can drive off and, and look at some of these sites. Uh, you know, right. obviously okay. wear a mask, but you know what? You don't have to worry about ghosts because they don't need masks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be sharing my screen here. Can everybody see the first slide in Michigan Haunts? Not yet. Oh, okay. Um, Seeing a lot of interested faces. Okay, so we have to do my screen share. Okay, I have to do the share again. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'll do the desktop and ah, that was right. There yep. we go. And here we go, and put it on the. <laughs> there we go. Everybody um, see that? That's our title of our book. There we go. Yeah. Yay. Okay, that's a great start. Here's the title of our book. And here we go with the first slide, which is John. All right, uh, the two way in is one of the most frequently mentioned haunted sites in our region. For those of you who have never been there, and I hadn't been there until we started this process, it's in the Northwest area of Detroit near Hamtramck. And Mary Aganowski, who is you see pictured on the left there, is the owner. She calls it the oldest dive bar in Detroit and it might be the most haunted one too, but when they moved there, she was only 17. That was back in the early 60s. And her parents and she moved into the apartments upstairs. You can see this old white structure there. And according to Mary, the day they moved in, her mother was awakened from an afternoon nap because she saw a strange bearded man sitting on the bed staring at her. So obviously she screamed. And uh, that kind of prompted their interest in investigating the history of the house. And what they learned was that that building was built in 1872 by Colonel Philetus W. Norris. And he had been a Union spy in the Civil War. And he'd been the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park. He settled that area. You can see him there in the picture on the left. Uh, and he looks like a pretty ruddy fellow with his, uh, his uh, deerskin uh, coat there and his cap. Uh, and of course, the minute they found that photo, Mary's mother said that was the man that had been staring at her. So ever since then, the Colonel and his daughter and perhaps a lot of other friendly but mysterious spirits have been hanging around 
walking through the bar, calling people by name, turning TVs and jukeboxes on and off, and uh, also slamming the ladies' room door. You see that ladies' room in the middle of the picture there. Uh, Mary was one of the first people to encounter this phenomenon, but you try to go into the ladies' room. Uh, if you've had a few drinks and you want to uh, you relieve yourself, ladies find that there's a heavy force that pushes against that door and slams shut. And after a while, you, you uh, get curious and you find there's nobody in there. So now it's just become a regular joke. You know, they see people go towards the door and it slams and, and they all laugh because they know no one's in there. It's an interesting place. Uh, if any of you have ever been to Novi, to this restaurant, it was also called Home Sweet Home. This is a, a mansion built by Charles Rogers, who was, and I love this, he was the condensed milk king of Northville. Boy, condensed milk, he, there used to be a lot of money in that because he built this house, which was considered a huge mansion in 1929. And now it's a restaurant called Shiro. It's a very good Asian restaurant. And it, when you walk in, the first thing you see, and you can see on the bottom there is this grand staircase. And Charles Rogers built that staircase because he always had this vision of a daughter ha having a wedding and she would go down the staircase as part of the wedding. Well, he only had sons, but one of the sons had a daughter. So he started planning this elaborate wedding for his granddaughter. Well, did you know that ungrateful granddaughter eloped and Charles Rogers, the condensed milk king, died of a broken heart. But it is said that you still see him in the restaurant, imagine him in his tuxedo, still planning that wedding, walking down the staircase. And people that visit the restaurant also see other sightings. The mirror sometimes breaks, the silverware flies around. But I love the image of a ghostly, well-dressed uh, father of the bride or grandfather of the bride walking down that fabulous staircase. Absolutely, and anybody who uh, is in, enjoys Japanese food and, and uh, sushi and so forth, that's a great place to go. Now, if you go down Grand River towards Brighton, you ultimately come to the little village of New Hudson, and uh, you're going to encounter the New Hudson Inn. You see it there in the upper left there, uh, and uh, it's been a stagecoach shop uh, stop there since 1831. Uh, now, there's no more stagecoaches there. Usually you see motorcycles, but um, it is uh, considered a pretty haunted place where patrons and waitresses have long reported strange encounters of spirits brushing past and things went walking through the room and so forth. And during a recent renovation, if you look at this picture in the center of the screen, or it's actually up to the right, they, uh, the workmen actually uh, removed a pillar, a support pillar, and inside they found concealed the shaft to a secret room that led upstairs. There was a secret room in the second floor that you could only access by a ladder through that opening, you see. And they believe now, uh, according to the New Hudson Historical Society, that this was a secret room for harboring fugitive slaves during the time of the Underground Railroad. Now, since that discovery, if you look at the bottom left there, they have actually found collections of bottles, hats, shoes in that secret room. And uh, it's just amazing that the uh, things they find, but the workmen who've been working upstairs have been complaining about uh, a fellow who's dressed in clothes better suited to the 19th century who keeps watching them work. And when they complain about it, the manager says, there's nobody like that here. So apparently there's somebody that really wants to inspect their work. <laughs> we also, this book is also in our Grand River book. It is uh, considered one of the oldest continually operating bars and restaurants in 1831. And in our book, you see, it looks almost exactly like it did in 1831. Yeah. They haven't done a whole lot of renovations. No, no. Uh, we've encountered a lot of fun ghosts along the way that we'll tell you about. We've got jealous ghosts. We've got coffee drinking ghosts. We call these the frisky ghosts. There's a place near Jackson that has been around actually since 1831. It was also a stagecoach stop. It was also called the Metal Lark Inn for a while in the 20s. And it used to be a speakeasy during Prohibition. Now it's known as the Roadhouse. And it's got its own share of ghosts. It's, the ghosts there love to pinch the waitresses. I don't know any other way of putting it. The waitresses will turn around to smack somebody. There won't be anybody there. The other fun thing about this place is if you look up here where I'm going to put my cursor on the upper left under the eat sign, 
they people patrons will look over and sometimes see an image of a, a ghostly chef looking out and grinning at them which of course startles them after a few drinks the other fun thing about this place is there's a spice rack in there and several times a year the spice rack will not only just come off the wall it'll literally fly across the wall and just smack against the other wall and we think that might be a former chef who thinks they're not seasoning the food correctly because he doesn't seem to be very happy. So there's a lot of fun ghosts. There's a mobster allegedly buried in the basement. This is a fun field trip to go to the roadhouse to, to multiple ghosts. Now I'm guessing that a lot of folks here have been to the Kagshu Cafe. And of course it's one of Detroit's most popular places to congregate. It's actually been around since the 20s when it was a speakeasy and it's been a favorite of Belgian immigrants uh, and a hub of Flemish culture for nearly a hundred years. It's also famous for its Belgian ales and steamed mussels. Um, look down there at the lower left and you'll see another uh, attraction oh, there. Oh, this is the uh, feather bowling, which is kind of like bocce ball. It's very fun. You throw these wooden balls on a dirt track and you try to get the closest to the feather, much like bocce ball. Very fun. The only place to do it in Detroit. That's right. Now, if you look up uh, at the center uh, to the right, you'll see the uh, DeVosses. These are Robert and Yvonne DeVos. They were immigrants from Belgium in the 50s, and they bought the place, and they brought their parents with them, and they all lived there uh, uh, nearby, and they, they would work in the basement. And um, apparently, they liked it so much that even though they're all long passed away, they uh, apparently have stuck around, and their son Ron, who you see over on the far right, he's he's in charge now, uh, and he says they're still hanging around, especially his mother. In fact, Ron says his mother frequently answers the phone when he calls in to check with the day manager. He says it's kind of uncanny. He says I I hear this unmistakable voice of hers in in the accent, and I say, and it says hello, and I said, you know, I always say, mom. He says, and then there's dead silence, and then the day manager comes on, and she has absolutely no idea who was on the phone or anybody was on the phone. And I always say, there's a good son who calls his mother even though she's dead. That's a very good son. <laughs> now, you know, the manager and the staff and the people that work there, they all have had odd encounters at the Cashew Cafe. And one of the bartenders actually told us that one night around 2 in the morning while it was closing up, a lady in a dress came out of the ladies room and he said ma'am i'm sorry but we're closed and he said i looked at her and she looked at me and then she burst into a million colors and just vaporized in front of me mm. and he said that's when i knew it was time to go home <laughs> uh, hmm. okay but, uh, uh, all right now, how many people out there, I wonder, you know, and, and this is a holdover from when I used to do this live. I'd say, how many people have heard of Eloise and, and I get a, a show of hands, but we can't do that today. So raise your hand if you want. <laughs> I won't really be able to know if you're doing that. But uh, on the next slide, you'll All right. See, <laughs> I uh, am having technical difficulties, so I'm going to stop the sh Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. We have our next show. Okay, we're going back down. The next slide you're going to see is actually of Eloise. Uh, Eloise is probably the most infamous and heavily haunted place in Michigan, of course. Um, it's the place that most of us grew up knew, knowing about, and the place that, you know, we all said, oh, that's Stopping really the share and then doing the share again, sorry, but. It's all right. Okay. Eloise is the place that we all knew that you were going to take you when they said they're coming to take you Keep away. Keep going, right? John. <laughs> What's that? Keep going. Yeah. When they all said that they're going to take you away, and Eloise was there where they would take you. And uh, there it is. There's Eloise. Yay. Uh, Eloise actually goes back to 1831 in Detroit when it was known as the Wayne County Poorhouse and Sanitarium. And they used to put away alcoholics and drug addicts and, um, you know, the feeble-minded and so forth. Uh, people who they said have lost their mind, basically undesirables. And in 1839, they moved it 
to uh, a place out in what was then the wilderness, now what's known as Westland, Michigan. And in less than 100 years, it had grown to encompass more than 900 acres with 75 buildings and 10,000 residents. This place like, had its own farm, it had its own dairy, it even had its own post office. And there's the, um, the why it was named for Eloise, it was the head of the, of, of Eloise's da daughter was named Eloise and that's how it got its name. But it was a really self-sufficient, almost a city. And to this day, even on eBay, they, you can find shoes that were made in Eloise, which are big collector's items. It was a huge place. Absolutely. Now, uh, as Gail said, in 1894, it was renamed Eloise uh, for the daughter of the superintendent. And uh, people over the years knew that thousands of people went there and were never heard from again. They were just forgotten. And there were a lot of unclaimed people when they happened to die. In fact, more than 7,000 people were buried in graves across the street and they were marked only by numbered stones. You see one here, uh, actually that's a picture I took. Uh, and we don't really know who these people were because we've lost all the records. What's that, Gail? Oh, I was saying they've lost all the records. We talked right. to somebody, there's no way of tracing these people. So again, it's a, it's a very sad thing to think people are just there with a number. That's right. Now, uh, as, as I said, I took that picture. I also took the picture you're gonna see here and usually I didn't get anything unusual on my pictures of the Eloise grounds, but here I got this one 35 millimeter shot. You can see Gail is circling it there where the circle is along the fence and I enlarged it. It was something very strange there. And when I enlarged it, you see on the right, there is a strange apparition behind the fence. And you can see it's actually behind the fence. You see the cross hatching. And it appeared to me when I desaturated it at the bottom, it looks like a woman in a black dress with a hat looking at me through the uh, fence. And I went back the next day to see what in the world that might have been, but there was nothing like that there. And it just, it appeared to me to be some woman saying, you know, what happened to everybody? I don't know if you can all see that. But it was certainly one of the strangest things I had ever seen. It's, it literally is haunting. And it's a Michigan Haunts exclusive. It's only in our book. John didn't put it anywhere else. I also wanted to add about Eloise. Maybe some of you have been reading about this. Somebody bought the property for a dollar. It had been owned by Wayne County. They were using it for offices now. Whatever's left of it. A lot of it's gone. Some guy bought it and he wants to turn it into a haunted hotel. He feels like people would come from all over the world and stay there because there's so much paranormal activity. And there are tours before COVID, there were tours that were sold out, especially in the fall. They were giving tours of what was left of Eloise. So there might be something to it. So we're gonna follow that development. Absolutely. Now we're gonna go a little bit towards the center of the state right now to an area called the Irish Hills, about a hundred miles from Detroit. Um, and you may be familiar with the Irish Hills. It was a popular tourist spot from the early 20s on. A lot of attractions and lakeside cottages. But in the 19th century, this area was considered a scary place. Uh, a lot of the stage drivers were asked to avoid it because it was heavily wooded and it was rife with highwaymen and, and uh, other folk. The Potawatomi Indians considered it enchanted and sacred. And if you look at this map here from 1874, it was. Uh, there was an area there that they called Dead Man's Curve, and it's not because Jan and Dean drove their Corvette down that way. It's because there's a lot of Potawatomi buried there. And when they resurfaced the road here across from the Siam School in 1924, they unearthed the remains of nine Potawatomis that uh, had been buried along the road there. You can see that down here. You can see the exhumed skulls. This was in 1924. So they were essentially disturbing the graves. And what's nice about it is, what, what nice is they actually reburied the bones and they did it in a very respectful way. Uh, you can see there was a ceremony back then and they, uh, children brought flowers, they put a cairn and they, re, you know, they gave um, all kinds of Bible passages. So they actually reburied these in a very respectful manner. All right, and this was next to the historic Walker Tavern, which is still a historic site. There it is right there, the Walker Tavern. As I like to say, look at it. It looks like uh, TripAdvisor would get a very low rating if you actually stayed there. <laughs> look at those windows. Uh, 
Um, and yeah. what was distinguished about the uh, Walker Tavern, it was a, a place where actually a lot of famous people came. John, James Fenimer Cooper stayed there, Daniel Webster stayed there, but it became a huge tourist attraction because someone was murdered there. They never were able to solve the mystery. A man came to gamble one night, went to bed, his name was Hipsley, he wo and uh, someone murdered him in his sleep. And instead of cleaning up the room or whatever, they decided to turn it into a tourist attraction. You know, this is before the internet. So for 25 cents, and if you look on the card on the bottom here, number 12, it's the murder room. So for 25 cents, you could go through the whole tavern and see something called the murder room up here on the left. They left it exactly as it was. They found his horse down the road and they found a blood stain next to his bed, but they never found him. And you can see there's some cards, a whiskey bottle. So basically you could traipse through for 25 cents and see where this guy died in the Walker Tavern. That's right. And the, you know, the Walker Tavern is a, a registered historic site and it's considered highly haunted. You see the photos at the bottom. Uh, these were taken by a ghost hunter named Jeff Westover. And uh, he set up a camera in there when no one was there. Uh, and you see in this hallway, in the middle of the night, he recorded this strange movement that would go back and forth across the hallway, you can see in the photo at the right. So it's a very haunted and actively haunted place. And you can visit that. Now, just across from that Siam School is an old farmhouse. And in 1916, one of the original residents, Eleanor Secor, who was born in the 1830s, she recalled how when she was a child, they were digging a cistern, this was about the 1850s, and the workmen uncovered the remains of a Potawatomi child that had been buried and wrapped in tan bark. And when they opened up the tan bark to reveal the remains of the child, it crumbled to dust. And she said that her parents uh, and she were surprised the next morning in the middle of the night, in fact, when they saw something glowing on the front porch and they looked out the windows and they saw the image of a lady, a woman, obviously a Potawatomi woman, and she was looking through the windows and in the door and she seemed to be looking for something. And of course, if they were anything like you and I, I wouldn't open the door either. They didn't open the door and they watched the woman disappear into the field afterwards. And they believed she was looking for that child that they had found wrapped in tan bark. Closer to Detroit, this is a wonderful story. Well, wonderful. It's a very interesting story because very few people know about it. You probably walk past this building. This is near the new arena on Woodward. This is uh, near the Masonic Temple. And this was the Alhambra. It was a beautiful Art Deco building built in the 20s. That whole top floor there was taken up by Harvey Firestone of Firestone Tire Fames. This was, what happened here was called the trial of the century. Of course, it was 1905, so the century was really new. But what happened, there was a cook named Rose Barron. She was demoted to being a scrub woman. She was very unhappy about it. And she decided to bake one last thing, a batch of biscuits, and she put arsenic in there and gave them out to everyone in the apartment building. Two people died and she went on trial. Well, as I said, it was a national trial. It was like the OJ trial at the time. She had a very good lawyer. This is the best picture I could find of her, Rose oh. Barron. And uh, she had a very good lawyer who miraculously got her acquitted by saying that arsenic poisoning had something to do with the faulty plumbing in the, in the apartment. So she was acquitted. About a month or so later, her father-in-law died of mysterious circumstances. What did they find out he died of? Arsenic poisoning. Uh -oh. Well, there you go. But uh, so <laughs> those apartments are still there. Um, the Illiches own them. We think they're going to demolish them. So if you happen to be by that area, take a look at them. People still see ghosts, uh, ghostly faces peering out the top windows and hear cries. Now we're going to go a little further west. We're going to the Doherty Hotel in Clare. Clare is mid Michigan. It was what interesting about Claire is during Prohibition, this is where the Purple Gang used to hang out. This was when things got too hot in Detroit, they headed for Claire. And you'll see on the lower right, uh, two of the Purple Gang killed each other. One was a lawyer and one was uh, just a Purple Gang member and they had a fight in the bar room and one killed the other. And it said his ghost still haunts the hotel. The Doherty Hotel is still there. It's a beautiful place. It was built in the 20s, but they found another few things there as well recently. In the upper right, you see Purple Gang built an actual escape tunnel. They found that recently so they could 
get out of the place without anybody seeing them. To the left here is the tap room where the murder occurred. And on the lower left, you can see that the Purple Gang were somewhat camera shy. That's a good picture of them. And to the right is uh, the speakeasy. They found some of the equipment where they used to make some of the things. And also the ghost of Mrs. Doherty holds the hotel. And we call that a smelling ghost because she, she always wore gardenia perfume. And sometimes when you're walking through the hotel, all of a sudden you'll get this weird whiff of gardenia perfume. And that's Mrs. Doherty saying hello, or at least the ghost of her. Mm -hmm. Now, another ghost, uh, we call this a jealous ghost. This is up in Traverse City. This used to be called the Bowers Harbor Inn. You used to be able to stay there. However, uh, now it's called the Mission Table Restaurant and you can't stay there, but the building is still there. And it was built in the 20s and it was built um, for the uh, uh, Genevieve and her, um, built by her husband, Douglas. And uh, he, he built her this wonderful mansion and she liked to eat a lot of her own products. She made these wonderful jams. Well, unfortunately, she grew so heavy that she could no longer go up the stairs. So her husband put in an elevator. He also hired a nurse to take care of Genevieve, a rather attractive nurse, as you can see there. Uh, well, one thing led to another. And when her husband died, he left the entire fortune to the nurse. Genevieve was so despondent that she ended up hanging herself in the elevator that her husband built for her. And to this day in the restaurant, if you can see on the lower right, there's no longer electricity or any working parts in the elevator, yet people see and hear the elevator lighting up, going up and down stairs. They think Genevieve is still haunting the place that was built for her. And some people even recall seeing Genevieve looking at them in the mirror of the ladies' room on the first floor. Now, as you might imagine, haunted places uh, tend to be places that are isolated or uh, where there's been trauma. And lighthouses are actually considered haunted in most cases as well. Detroit and Michigan uh, actually uh, boast of having the most lighthouses in the, the entire United States. Michigan has 110 lighthouses and, um, and used to have even more. One of the most famously haunted lighthouses is the Old Presqu'ile Light, which was built in 1840. You see it on the left there. That's near Alpena. And even though it is no longer wired or capable of lighting or illuminating, to this day, it still lights up. And news, you know, sometimes you might even see this on the news. They'll have features on it. They'll show it at night. And it actually does illuminate. Ships see it at sea, and they have no idea how it continues to light, because there's no physical way that it's possible. But again, it's been on news programs, you can see it yourself, uh, and they really can't explain why that's the case. Though some people say that the old lighthouse keeper, if you'll pardon the expression, never gave up the ghost. You know, it was very lonely for lighthouse keepers, and every lighthouse we visited in Michigan, and as John said, there's lots of them, they had a story about the lighthouse keeper, because it was very lonely. They'd be there, for example, on the right in South Haven, James Donahue lived there for 35 years. He was a lighthouse keeper who lost his leg in the Civil War. And imagine, now you had to light that light four or five times a day. That right out there, the lighthouse was 75, originally was 75 feet, now it's longer. So that poor man with his wooden leg had to go out and light that light four or five times a day, back and forth. And it is said now he still lives here, uh, it's a lighthouse museum, you can see on the bottom here, and visitors still hear poor James Donahue, they hear him with his wooden leg going up and down the steps. Imagine how ghostly that is to hear the wooden leg being dragged up and down the steps. Mm. And uh, so there's every lighthouse story, and we have a lot more in the book, uh, has an interesting story about the lighthouse keeper. Absolutely. There's also a lot about flying Dutchman. Many of you may be aware that a flying Dutchman is what they call or they refer to as a ship that is lost and never seen again. But when it, uh, it does actually uh, reappear as a ghostly ship, uh, one of the most famous uh, in Michigan was Lou Griffin, which was actually a uh, Cadillac's flagship. It was the largest sailing vessel to ever appear on the Great Lakes when it was uh, christened in 1697. And it was lost on its maiden voyage. It went from Detroit to Green Bay, where it was lost. And it never is, uh, excuse me, but that's the beginning of Detroit going to Green Bay and losing. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> continued last Sunday, but keep going, John. <laughs> that was the origin of it. Back in 1697, we were losing. But go, That's sorry. right. Losing a green day. That's right. Now, if you want to visit a uh, haunted uh, ghost ship today, you still can. The USS Edson, you see it in the upper right there, actually was built in 1958, and it's called the Great Ghost. It's now Dawson Bay City. It was a Vietnam-era ship, and it was actually uh, used in combat there. And it's considered highly actively haunted. You can go up and down and throughout all the corridors and the engine rooms and the radio rooms, and you can often hear voices in the next room, but there's no one there. Uh, a lot of times someone will be talking over the PA system and there's no one there on the system. It's just voices that come out of nowhere. And another strange phenomenon is visitors often find their cars are running in the parking lot when they come back out of the museum. And there's no, uh, if there's no key in the lock. It's just running. <laughs> Which comes in handy in the winter. Okay, um, the name Rouge is the Detroit's oldest tradition. Um, very quickly, it's just in 1700, Cadillac, who founded Detroit, was walking along, saw a little red dwarf, hit it with his cane, and he, the, the dwarf cursed him and decided to put a curse on Detroit. So anytime any trauma has ever happened in Detroit, ranging from the 1805 fires or the riots in the 60s in Detroit, people report seeing a little red dwarf. Well, over the last 10 years, there's been a tradition in Detroit. People, very few people realize there's this huge parade that happens in the spring. It happens in March. It's our own version of Mardi Gras. It happens around the Cass Corridor. Last year, there were 10,000 people showed up for this parade and people go up and down the streets um, carrying uh, red items that are red with canes and really celebrating this tradition of the Red Dwarf. Now, up in, Man up in Mackinac Island, there's the tradition of Lover's Leap, which many of you may have seen up there on the right. That's an old Native American legend where uh, a Native American princess wanted to marry her boyfriend. Her dad didn't approve. So she leapt off Lover's Leap to her death, putting a curse on the entire island. That's right. And the curse was that you're doomed to eat bugs forever. <laughs> Which has continued to this day. And John found this old stereoscope of the drowning pool, which is a place in Mackinac Island, which people don't realize it was our own version of the witch trials when the whole witch trial thing was going on. And the way they would try and see if people were witches, that they would throw them off into the drowning pool, these women. And if they were, uh, if they drowned, that meant they were a witch. And if they survived, they were a witch. Uh, pretty bad form of justice back then, but uh, right. that on. Talk about damned if you do or you don't, right? Now, the most famous and uh, most widely accepted uh, phenomenon of that kind in Michigan is called the Paulding Light. And the Paulding Lights are a phenomenon that can be viewed up near Water Street, Michigan, and it has been viewable for many, many years. Uh, People go along the road there, and this happens almost every night. People see these lights come towards them. They're uh, bright lights. They turn colors. They go over their head, and then they disappear. No one has been able to explain what is the Paulding lights, but it's even a phenomenon. You see the little sign on the far right uh, that it is uh, actually recognized by the National Park Service. See a little Casper there. And there's some actual pictures on the next slide of the Paulding lights. Uh, We've These are ones that people have taken. We've had people that have told us they've been there and have seen the lights. And it's really a strange phenomenon. Afterwards, any of you can tell us if you've ever seen that. But it's so crazy because it's completely unsolved and the money is still out there, $100,000. So if we all want to just rent a van, I mean, with COVID, maybe we have to rent a few vans. We could all go up there. We could split the money, 100000 among everybody watching. It's still a pretty good payday. So it's uh, more, it's... It's one of Michigan's unsolved mysteries and people come from all over the world to try and solve this mystery. Yeah. Now, before we were in Bay City uh, to see the submarine, but when you're there, we highly recommend this place that we were really blown away by. The guy who built the State Theater, C. Howard Crane, built this beautiful Art Deco Theater in 1930 in Bay City and we took a tour. Look at the beautiful, it's got Mayan decoration. Look on the outside, the head of a Mayan warrior. 
inside. It's just got beautiful tile work. It's fantastic. Bay City has a lot of interesting haunted attractions. Our favorite thing about this theater, you can see on the bottom, there's a seat. And the, one of the former managers named Floyd Ackerman was murdered in 1943, but he still haunts the theater and he's seen there so much. They actually dedicated a seat to him and no one sits in the seat because sometimes when they're showing movies, Floyd will come in and watch a movie and people will see him. So there's a ghost who has his own seat uh, in, the, in, in Bay City. Mm -hmm. Fort Wayne is one of the most haunted places in Michigan. Uh, it's a very popular tourist site, but people who have been there uh, visiting even once have encountered strange sites. Um, one of the most frequent is people will be in the barracks on the third floor and they'll look out the window and they'll see soldiers marching by, which is an interesting sight since it's about 40 feet off the ground. Uh, the tunnels are considered highly haunted. People see apparitions in there. And strangely enough, the fort was built over 13 separate Native American burial mounds. So if you're looking for trouble, that's a great way to start, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the Skillman Library, which was the site of the last public execution in Michigan, you could see it on the upper right, uh, it was, looks like it was very well attended. People don't realize the Skillman branch of the Detroit Library was built, it was a jail for a while, and it was, a, and so it's very, very haunted, and people in that library regularly see ghosts and hear chains rattling, and, uh, and that still goes on to this day. I'm going to skip ahead to... Greenfield, oh, to, to the Whitney, which many of you have uh, probably gone to and had dinner at. And it's a, it was the uh, huge sandstone mansion built by the lumber baron, David Whitney. And it was the first private elevator in Detroit. And it also has beautiful Tiffany windows. And this place really embraces their ghosts. It's, um, it was built by David Whitney for his wife, Sarah. And she died before it could be built. And she was a big snob and she wanted this grand place. Well, he married her sister, Flora. And so to this day, Sarah is said to still haunt the mansion. People see her. She's very jealous of her sister getting to live in that <laughs> wonderful place. It's a wonderful restaurant. It's still going on. It even has a ghost bar you can see on the top floor there. And they're one of those places that really embrace their ghostliness. So it's a wonderful place to check out. Uh, John and I wanted to get you just a couple more places uh, before we have to stop, but one of the places we love to talk about is Greenfield Village and Henry Ford, because I was a tour guide at Greenfield Village, and Greenfield Village does not like to talk about the hauntings. They want to consider themselves very educational, and so they don't like to talk about it, but a lot of the places there are extremely haunted. And we're showing you a sampling here. The Wright Brothers home you can see that has doors that lock sometimes. No one can get in. They lock from the inside. No yeah. one's in there. Yes. And, yeah. and in the middle, we have the Firestone Farm. Firestone, again, I talked about. They have a ghost there that when we were uh, guides there, if you ever left a cup of coffee out, a ghost would come along and drink the cup of coffee. His daughter, Sally, was a coffee drinking ghost. The Noah Webster house has a lot of hauntings. So if you go there and ask the guides privately, they will tell you some ghost stories. Now, one of the most haunted places in Greenfield Village was the uh, Henry Ford Homestead. You can see here on the left. When I would work there, sometimes I would see the rocking chair rocking by itself, the spinning wheel would be going around, and sometimes books would be flying off the shelf. So if Henry's going to stay somewhere, we're, he's certainly welcome to his homestead. One of the funniest ghost stories from Greenville Village isn't really a ghost story at all. It's actually the fact that in the late 30s, they hired an elderly fellow to dress up as Abraham Lincoln, and he would uh, hold court there in the Logan County Courthouse where Lincoln had actually worked. Uh, one night, the night watchman came in, and the Lincoln portrayer had actually fallen asleep in a chair. So when the night watchman came in and startled Abe Lincoln, the night watchman screamed and ran out. <laughs> he was so startled that he'd seen the ghost of Abe Lincoln that he quit that night. And as I like to say, he quit drinking too, because when you see Abe Lincoln, <laughs> yeah, Lincoln stops you drinking. I mean, it rhymes, but yeah, there you go. So you go. also, if you're in the vicinity, obviously the Fairlane Estate, which many people 
you know, it's 31,000 square feet. This is where Henry Ford died. So it said his ghost still haunts there. And what we love about this place is people see haunted servants there. Only Henry Ford would have haunted servants. Sometimes you see a maid coming through with towels, a butler coming through with drinks. And my favorite thing is if you see the garage here on the lower right, sometimes you see a ghostly chauffeur polishing some of Henry Ford's cars. So he has haunted servants still working for him. And we want to end on, we have a few more, but we don't want to take up too much of your time, but we do love to end on what we call the Houdini Trail. And in our book, we have a whole chapter on this. Houdini is near and dear to Detroit because this is where he died. And so before then, he obviously made a lot of appearances in Detroit. And if you've ever seen the movie with Tony Curtis, where he jumps off the bridge, into freezing water, that happened in Detroit in 1906. You see him on the left there, his famous dive off the Belle Isle Bridge. Look at the Belle Isle Bridge on top. It used to be wooden. It burned on the 20s, but that's what it used to look like. He also, you see him on the lower right. Here he is at the Detroit Creamery. He's in a 75 gallon milk container full of milk, death by milk, but he didn't die. He escaped from there. What a way to go. And now you see him here he is in the Fife Building in 1922, and of course, Fife Shoes, we all remember that. The Fife Building is still there. We see Houdini suspended off the Fife Building in a straitjacket, was able to make the escape. And if you look to the left, you can see that some of his appearances were sponsored by none other than the J.L. Hudson Company, which mm -hmm. is still around, but that sponsored a lot of his. Um, his last appearance was at a place called the Garrick Theater, which is no longer around, but he was, did make a lot of appearances at the Majestic Theater, which just celebrated um, its 120th birthday, and they just restored the marquee on that as well. And you can see on the upper right, here's a free press article. So Houdini came uh, and performed. Um, he came, he was sick. He came from Montreal, he had a high fever, but as they say, the show must go on. So on October 31st, Houdini, 1926, Houdini had his last show at the Garrick Theater. Afterwards, he went back to his hotel room at the Statler Hotel, and he was feeling very ill, so they rushed him to the Grace Hospital. You can see up there, it kind of looks like a haunted house, but that's where he was rushed to. That is no longer around. After he died, and his last words were, I'm tired of fighting, he was rushed to uh, the morgue, which was you see below, which is also still around. This is on Cass. Um, it was a music school for a while, but that's where Houdini's body lay. And it is also considered very haunted. And the right there, John was able to find his death certificate. Um, he, it's very controversial as to what Houdini died of. People say it's of appendicitis. Uh, there's been controversy about that. But to us, what makes it interesting is that his ghost is still said to haunt various places within Detroit. The lower place on the left where his body lay, that's one of the places. But for 10 years afterwards, Houdini's wife, Bess, came back to Detroit and hold a seance. Because as you know, he went around debunking seances, but she wanted to contact him. And they made a pledge before he died. He said, if I ever do come back, I will be playing this song called Roosevelt Believe. That was a song that the two of them used to sing together in vaudeville where they met. So for 10 years, Mrs. Houdini would come to the Majestic Theater and hold a seance. And for 10 years, every year on Halloween, she would try and contact him. He never came back. And after 10 years, she said, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. And she never came back. But to this day, magicians from all over the world gather in Detroit on Halloween night and perhaps they're gonna gather this year to somehow conjure up the spirit of Houdini who last was seen in Detroit. And we hope this is the year. So that's a little quick trip around Detroit. Obviously in our book, we have a lot more places, but we wanted to take the time to let you ask any questions you may have, but we were gonna leave you on this slide. We have a Facebook page, Michigan Haunt Books. We also, if you didn't get a copy, we also have an email, michigahauntbooks at gmail.com, or you can contact Marianne about how to get a hold of us. But, you know, we obviously have a lot more to talk about, but we want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now and now turn it over to any questions or comments you may have. Hello again, everybody. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed it.
Anybody with a question? Or a comment, or any hauntings they want to talk about themselves. Yeah, and that's a good point. I actually uh, lived in a house that was uh, pretty haunted myself, and uh, that was one of the inspirations for this. But as Gail said, uh, we wanted to actually feature places you could visit. You can't just visit somebody's home, right? Anybody? Only once. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, if uh, nobody has questions, we could show you a couple more haunted places, uh, maybe that we uh, didn't get to. Does anybody want to do? Oops, sure. Go back to the. Uh, usually, people have. Oops. Fantastic. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, okay, wait. John, do you want to just? Should we, do we have time for John to tell about his haunted encounter in? Jackson, Michigan? I say yes. Sure. John, yeah. you're going to talk about it. And by the way, the DIA has some haunted places as well. Uh, that figure you see there, sometimes people say they see it running around the, the at night in the, can you imagine that, seeing that running around even during the day would be scary, I, but that I'm figure- I'm not seeing the picture, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, is anybody seeing the picture? No. Right. No, I think the sharing's done. All right, okay. but I can do That's the sharing. But John, I'm going to get back to the. Uh, That's okay. I'm going to get back to Jackson. I'm going to screen share this. Okay, go ahead, John. Right. Okay, so as Gail was saying, uh, in Jackson, there's an antique mall, and the antique mall is notoriously haunted to the point that even the people who work there are very uh, aware of the ghosts. Um, the old building used to be a brothel, and it was run by a woman named Blanche, and they believe Blanche is still there. They call her by name, and Blanche will even talk to you. She actually talked to me once, and it was pretty startling. Um, you'll see and hear her around. She rattles things. Uh, she'll move things around. She'll even move things around in front of you. And one day I was there with a friend, and I had heard about her. And as we were walking down the stairs into the basement, my friend said, well, what's the ghost's name? And it, it all of a sudden occurred to me, it was Blanche. And I said, how are you doing today, Blanche? And all of a sudden, from all around us, we heard this elderly lady's voice say, I'm fine. And we just looked at each other and were startled. We heard the exact same voice phenomenon at the same time. And it seemed to be directionless. We couldn't even imagine where it come from. We told the lady at the front desk and she laughed and she said, Blanche talks to people all the time. And that's always how it is. She's helped people put clasps on their bracelets. She's, she's moved ladders across the wall, all kinds of things. Now the Jackson Antique Mall is a popular stop. It's a great place to go. But apparently there's several ghosts in there and they're sighted very frequently. So put on your mask and, and go to the DIA slide that I was talking about earlier, that 19th century African nail figure, they see it sometimes running around at night. And as I said, it would be very startling to see it running around even during the day. And if you happen to be up in Holland, there's a one last wonderful story, which is this man, Dora Felt, built this mansion for his wife, Agnes, in 1928. She died before it could be completed. And he died soon after, but at night, people actually see them waltzing around together in the mansion together. They were a very happy couple, very much in love. And I love the idea of having ghosts that can waltz around together. They're still in love even after death. And to the right there, apparently his fortune was made by a very early computer slash adding machine called the Comptometer. And in one of our shows, somebody came and said, I used to use the Comptometer. So if anybody out there has used the Comptometer, uh, please let us know. That's right. So I think that uh, kind of covers a lot of the haunted places. As Gail said, there are there are actually more than a hundred uh, publicly available haunted places in Michigan, Upper Peninsula, Lower Peninsula, and uh, now that we're in the throes of this pandemic, it might be good to take a road trip. 
uh, a lot of them are outdoor, you know, and as the winter comes on, you know, you can still enjoy a nice road trip. I have a question. Sure. Yes. It's about Meadowbrook Hall in Rochester Hills. Right. Are there any ghosts? You know, I have heard that it is uh, reputedly haunted. We couldn't find anybody who would tell us any of the stories associated with it. And that was key to being included in the book. We wanted to be able to recount some of the stories. Uh, for instance, the Kerwood Castle, we could find several people that would tell us what was going on there. But no one at Meadowbrook could tell us much about what had been encountered. Though people if have you have started. any information, let us know, because we're considering doing a second haunted book, and we'd That's love right. to include Meadowbrook in there. Again, we have our email, michigahauntsbook at gmail. Please feel free to write to us or go on our Facebook page. We'd love to hear from people. And so far after this book has been published, people have been writing to us to suggest other places or just places in the book they've been to. So we'd love to hear from you. Have, have you heard of anything? Uh, is it Carolyn that asked that question? No, I'm a, I'm a docent and a host at the hall. Oh. Um, there are some rumors, but I wouldn't want to say anything. Uh, you need to get in touch with the curator okay. at the hall. Her you name know. is Madeline Radskowski, and yeah. you can find her name on the Meadowbrook Hall website. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. That's a big help. Thank you so much. Yeah. Terrific, Susanna. And, Maybe uh, some of the Dodges are there. Maybe some of yes, them are um, there. One of the Dodge uh, sons tragically died um, on his honeymoon on Manitoulin Island. And oh. there's a lot of documentation about that. I'm not saying that it's uh, anything to do with ghosts or haunting, but there is a fascinating history behind the people who built the hall and who lived in it for a while. Sure. That's a treasure. It's a wonderful place. Wonderful. Thank you so much Thank for you. that. Really, and I did. I did enjoy um, your talk, except that John was almost inaudible. There's something wrong with your microphone, John. Oh no! I I'm sorry no to say. That. Yes. Um, okay. That's my, 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 thanks for the yeah. feedback, though. Was my audio okay? Uh, Gail, uh, you carried the show. Oh. You're very, <laughs> you're very clear and um, very professional. I'm not saying that John isn't, but all we saw was the top of his head as he leaned forwards, and it was very difficult to hear you. Okay. Well, thank you really, for the a really this fascinating talk. Show. Just fascinating. Thank you. thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Did did uh, all of you experience difficulty hearing me? Well, I, I thought I could hear you pretty good, John. It was a little muffled, and I think it's just because you're, you're too close to your speaker. Really? You know, you kept leaning in like that, and sometimes uh, when you sit back, the closer you get to the microphone and the speaker, it's the circularization that it does. Hmm. And, and so the farther you step back, the, like, the better it is. But I could hear everything you said. All right. I could, I could hear everything. Yeah, I would have interrupted you otherwise. I mean, mm -hmm. it could have been clearer, but I I could hear everything. But Susanna, she is um, she's always uh, wonderful to tell me like how we can make things better. So I just love her to death. Oh, we appreciate no, I, I any appreciate feedback because as right. we said, we've, we've given this tour, we've given this talk maybe a hundred times in person, but we yeah, never give. This was your first talk. Zoom. That's yes, right. thank you everybody for being our essential guinea pigs. I use Zoom a lot. I teach at Lawrence Tech, so I use Zoom a lot for my classes, but I've never done, you know, this talk on it, so. Well, it was fantastic. So interesting. I would surely love to have you both back because so I can't much. get enough. I yeah. want to look love at to your do our other Grand River talk too. That would be great. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. We love coming to OPC in person. What a treasure you have. I have to tell you, we've been to a lot of senior places. I live in Heartland. I wish I had an OPC near me. You guys have a wonderful facility and the programming mm -hmm. is so great. I wish I lived closer thank so you. I could join. So thank you so well, much. Well, you know, there's a lot of senior centers, but there's only one OPC. So there true. you go. <laughs> so um, but I do want to say that um, I want to thank John for getting me some pre-sale um, books. We sold those all out. I do have two other people that are interested. I'll check back with them, but if any of you, and I'll send out a, an email to everyone with the link 
to the recording. If anybody else wants a, a signed copy of the book, John has agreed to drop off a couple more uh, copies for me. And so, we can always mail them to people. We mail pe to people. Okay, all fantastic. So, yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thanks again. And, uh, Stay safe. Yeah, thank Lynette. Um, I want to say thank you to Lynette um, from Anthology of Troy. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done it without you. It was a great show. I loved it. Good, good. Well, thanks for if sharing this. If anybody has any us. other haunted stories, send them to us as well. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. And, and Lynette, I'll send your contact information with the email as well. Thank you very much. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank a haunted you. October. Uh -huh. Thank, you. Thank you. Share your stories yeah. with me, too, because I love them. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.